Welcome to Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, and Patty Callahan Henry are four longtime friends with more than 70 published books between them. Together, they host Friends and Fiction with author interviews and fascinating insider talk about publishing and writing to highlight and support independent bookstores. They discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hello, everyone. It's Wednesday night at seven o'clock, and that means it's time for what we think is the happiest hour on the internet, friends and fiction. We have an amazing night ahead of us, so let's get started. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey. I'm Patty Callahan Henry. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. I'm Kristen Harmel. And this is Friends and Fiction, four New York Times bestselling authors, endless stories to support indie bookstores, authors, and librarians. Tonight, we'll be talking with Team W, the New York Times bestselling trio of Beatrice Williams, Lauren Willig, and Karen White. And then we have Miriam Parker on the second part of the show. So, so much exciting stuff going on. Make sure you don't miss a minute. Yeah, we're so excited. But first, before we get started, did you know that we at Friends in Fiction are currently reading Tamron Hall's As the Wicked Watch in our Behind the Book Club with the Fable app? So you know Tamron as an Emmy award-winning TV journalist, and we hope that you caught our amazing episode with her last week. Um, she was so, so much good. fun. I just feel like she had such great stuff <laughs> so to say. Oh my yeah. God, I just walked away from that one so inspired and just, I don't I know. know, just wonderful. But in the Fable app, we're diving deep into the themes, characters, everything having to do with her book. And I'm leading the discussion, sharing all my favorite moments from the book and talking about them with you. So all you have to do to read along with us is to download the Fable app and join our premium club full of behind the scenes info you will not get anywhere else. It's just $5 a month to join, but right now they're offering a free 14 day trial if you download the app. So visit fable.co backslash friends and fiction to sign up today. And I love the 14 days because you can yeah. tap into it, see if you're having fun, yeah. which it's us, of course you will. And then, then you can decide. So you don't have to decide, yeah. you know, before you try it. Okay. And don't forget, as you know, we say it every week, we continue because it's so important to encourage you to support independent booksellers wherever you can. But one really important way to do that is if you're ordering online, you can visit our friends in fiction bookshop.org page where you'll find Team W's book, Miriam's book, books by the four of us, and books by all of our past guests. If you browse through the bookshop.org page of Friends and Fiction, I mean, when you go back with all those guests, we have a heck of a bookstore going on. It's pretty <laughs> great. We do. We've had a lot of great guests. So also each week, if you guys have been tuning in, you might have noticed we have been giving you a chance to ask us anything. So if you have a question you'd like to, for the four of us to answer, we are all ears. Um, you can drop it here in the comments now for future weeks or... <laughs> um, or we um, sort of have a, a running... Um, list going in our announcements on our Facebook page. So you can drop your questions in there too. So this week's question is from Diana Kuhn McGoldrick. And I love this one. Do any of you see yourself switching tracks for an upcoming book or going back to a genre that you've written before, or perhaps, perhaps trying something new altogether? What about you, Kathy? Mary Kay? Uh, well, you know, I've already done that. Been there. Yeah. Done that. <laughs> yeah. So I started out writing category mystery, then I switched over to uh, women's fiction, and now I'm kind of uh, a hybrid of the two. And I really, I really enjoy what I'm writing. I mean, we never say never, right? Yeah. I, you know, I've said never about things and then done them, of course. But I, it's like Kathy, like Mary Kay, I've done it too. I was writing contemporary and. It wasn't a deliberate switch, but my last five books, including the one coming up, have all been historical. And they sometimes sneak in a little, you know, magical realism or fairy tale. But I never say never, but gosh, I love what I'm doing just right yeah. now. 
Yeah. Patty, your hair looks so pretty tonight. I didn't see it until you were like on a big close up. It looks very oh pretty. Gosh, yeah. <laughs> Maybe that's because I had it cut and colored yesterday. Oh, so. it looks great. Very Compliments fun. to your hairstylist. <laughs> that's funny. Um, you know, for me, just like as with the two of you, um, I have I'm already kind of in that second phase of my career, switching genres. And it didn't occur to me until now, Christy, what a great question that is for tonight, because I actually worked with Miriam Parker, who's our second guest tonight. Oh my gosh. In in the earlier phase of my career when I was writing romantic comedy. So I'm a completely different author than I was back when she knew me. Um I don't know that I'll always write World War II. I mean, I, I have at least one more World War II book in me, if not more, but I think I'll always write the kind of stories I'm writing now. So it, it, they might take place in different periods of time, but like, I, I think I have found, I've hit my stride of who I am as a writer, if that makes sense. I love that. I think you have too, for sure. Oh, um, not that I, I haven't read your first books, which I really want to. I need to go back and do that <laughs> on my list because um, I'm sure they're amazing. Well, now um, I know what to get you for Christmas. All right. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> no, I'm just awesome. kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> I love that. So I did something a little bit different with the wedding veil, you know, and having a historical storyline, which is something that I hadn't really done before. And I did really like that. Um, I said the whole time, it was like, I'm never going to write about real people again. This is too hard. And then of course, like throughout the course of writing it and after I've had like all these real people that I want to write about. So I can see myself doing that again, but um I don't know. I mean, Summer of Songbirds is pretty much a contemporary novel, which um, I, I think I, I think I could sort of do a little bit of both of those. Um, I, I really enjoy both of those. Although I did the other day, I texted all of them. I was like, y'all, I was in the shower and I just had the best idea for a rom-com, which like I- <laughs> I know that's what you texted to the group. Yeah. <laughs> and I was like, that's definitely not what I write. But like, you know- Hey, I mean, Patty said, well, you can write whatever you want. I was like, well, that's exactly what I said. <laughs> Nobody gets to tell us. I mean, that they can true. tell us what to write, but that doesn't mean that's what we'll write. So nobody yeah. puts baby in a corner. And can I just say, I think that Mary Kay has already just gone off to begin writing in her next genre. She's yeah, she just so inspired that, yeah. You know how she's <laughs> really into speculative fiction and fantasy writing? <laughs> That's what she's doing. That's what I speak. was going to say. She's just run off to do that. She just so. loves that kind of stuff. So she does. She does. All right. Well, in the meantime, let's introduce our first guests for the night. Um, Team W is a New York Times bestselling trio composed of Beatrice Williams, Lauren Willig, and Karen White. As you all know, <laughs> Beatrice Williams is the bestselling author of 13 novels, including The Golden Hour, Her Last Flight, and The Summer Wives. A native of Seattle, she now lives with her husband and four children children near the Connecticut shore. Lauren Willig is a USA Today and New York Times bestselling author of 20 novels, including The English Wife, The Summer Country, and The Ashford Affair. She lives in New York City with her family. And last but not least, Karen White. We used to live in the same city but sadly, we don't anymore. She lives in Atlanta, but she is a USA Today and, of course, New York Times bestselling author of over 20 novels, including The Lights Went Out, The Night the Lights Went Out, and you are so lucky I didn't start singing. And I was going to write you. Dang. <laughs> Uh, no, that's probably the reason I got to sign this one. And Dreams of Falling. She currently lives, like I said, near Atlanta, Georgia with her husband. The three of them, the trio, has previously collaborated on several novels, such as All the Ways We Said Goodbye. All right, Sean, bring them on. Hi. Hi, lady. Hi, lady. We're so Hello. excited you're here. Thank you for having us. Yes. <laughs> it's it's weird because we gosh we haven't seen each other in so long. Oh wait, a week. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> we saw each other last week. Never mind. Yes. Okay. Not, not, that yeah. long. Not that long. Yeah. Well, um, of you, wine. Beatrice, I do not have wine. We did not have an open bottle, and I didn't want to open it for just. I'm sorry. I love, I love you. I let the team down. I'm sorry. <laughs> we're shaming you 
It's so funny. Well, we absolutely could not put the Lost Summers of Newport down, and we are so excited to discuss it with you tonight. But before we begin, um, can one of you tell us what this book is about? And then can you tell us what it's really about? Ooh, wow. Great question. Uh, so Lost Summers of Newport is uh, like all of the books we do in collaboration, three uh, women, three different time periods. Uh, it's set in Newport, Rhode Island uh, in the present day. We have a woman who's a reality show producer uh, working on a show about renovating a Newport cottage. So, of course, we go back into the past, uh, the Gilded Age, when uh, the house was built, and then the 1950s, uh, when some... Uh, you know, a middle generation comes along uh, and starts uncovering the secrets uh, that went into the building of the house. So uh, it's about that multi-generational, uh, you know, three women, one house uh, kind of book, but it's really kind of about, uh, you know, the, the, the evolution of a family and the evolution of Newport from being this playground of the wealthy to how do we turn this into, uh, now that the generations can no longer afford forward to live there uh, into, you know, a museum so that everyone can come and enjoy uh, the architecture uh, and that just experience of being in one of these amazing Newport cottages. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Was... I'd like to say a little bit about time travel too, because old buildings are basically time capsules, you know, because sure. um, we have this family in the Gilded Age, and then we see the same family in the 50s, and then we kind of see what's left of them in uh, modern day. And I just find that fascinating because we all, we all, we've all read time travel. We all love time travel. If you don't, you need to go back and read Diana Gabaldon. But um, um, I, I think I, because we all love history and we've all written historical fiction, I we all love the way that the past informs the present and being able to write those three different time frames is just i mean that's the fun part sure yes i love the whole if those walls could talk theme and in this case as our modern character peels away the peeling wallpaper and starts prying behind the rotting beams of the house those walls really do talk and it's sort of the way in which myths get formed over the generations and you have to peel back the layers of story and fable that families spin around themselves to try to get back to what that really happened what really happened and figure out what that does to people and their sense of identity mm -hmm. sure yeah. that is yep yeah, uh, yeah absolutely um you know, it, it's interesting that you mentioned, uh, you know, these three, it, it was specifically the house and um, and these three characters. And Lauren, you are a tiny bit glitchy. It's a little hard to hear you. So I don't know if it maybe makes sense to try to pop back out and pop back in. Because yeah. it actually I'll sounded like you were, it, it sounded like you were coming from the future, which is kind of yeah. in keeping. Yeah, with what we were talking about. Like, yeah. exactly, yeah. like, on brand. It was I on love brand. it. It's on oh, brand. Sorry. Yeah. Pop in again. Okay. 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 Sounds good. Perfect. Um. So, so ladies, while we're waiting for her to come back, um, as you mentioned, this multi-layered novel is told through these two, I'm sorry, these three different points of view and three different time periods. So we've got Andy in 2019, Ellen in 1899, and Lucky in 1958. So Sprague Hall, is that how you say it? Sprague? Sprague? Sprague. Well, there are some, it was originally Sprague because Sprague. Okay. we're kind of going off um, an Edith Wharton character. Um, a, oh. The Spragues of the Midwest come in, and then, of course, they sort of G G uh, S P R A G G, and then of course they sort of try to class up the name. Ah. Then we find out there actually is a Rhode Island family uh, that's pronounced Sprague. Uh, oh. So a lot of people on book tour were calling it Sprague uh, because they're identifying with that Rhode Island family. We didn't um, realize that until they were. Uh, as we were writing it, because we thought they were trying to sort of gentrify their name. Yeah. So Sp <laughs> Sprague Hall, Sprague. Yeah. Is that what we're? I like it. Okay. Not finally so, answered. <laughs> I, I like it. Okay. So it is this once glorious, now crumbling Newport mansion. It's at the center of the story. It connects all of these women's stories. And mm -hmm. I love that idea of if walls can talk and this house bearing witness to history. So ancient houses like this one certainly hold a lot of stories and a lot of secrets. How did you choose these three viewpoints as the lens through which to elaborate on the secrets that this house has seen? Well, it kind of goes back to where the story began. Uh, we kind of came across this reality show uh, in the UK. 
Okay. I, I am known for starting off my day with a cup of coffee and a little um, of what my co-authors call procrasta scrolling. Uh, on the she procrasta texts it to us and we procrasta read. <laughs> I think it might have been the Daily Mail. I found the story about uh, this reality show in Britain where they renovate old houses, but it's really about the families and the generations and the secrets. And I said, oh my gosh, this is a perfect W story, uh, three different generations. Let's move it to America. And of course, when you think of grand American houses, you think Newport. Uh, and and so the Gilded Age was the obvious place for, for one of those uh, stories, because that's, of course, when these houses were built. Modern day for the reality show. The tricky bit was where to have that middle narrative. Right. Sure. And then we, we accidentally stumbled. We knew we wanted mid-century. So, you know, sometime in the 50s. And again, Beatrice was procrasta scrolling. Like, I think we originally planned early 50s. And then during her procrasta scrolling, she discovered the Tiffany Ball, which took place in 1957 mm -hmm. in Newport. Huge social event uh, where the Kennedys were present. And of course, the Tiffany Ball, uh, the Tiffany Diamond. And um, so, of course, that just it made it easy to hone into a specific time period in the 50s. Ooh, I like that. And, um, and I have to oh, go ahead. Oh, no, no, please go ahead, Beatrice. No, I was just saying it was an event that really, and one of the things we wanted to highlight was that transition. Uh, you know, the mansions underwent from being family homes and showpieces to being museums open to the public in the 1950s. And, and the Tiffany Ball in particular uh, was an event that really kickstarted that preservation mo uh, movement. So mm -hmm. it kind of made sense, uh, you know, in terms of the narrative that we wanted to create uh, throughout that connected all three, three stories. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love that. You know, and I know the three of you are usually very um, secretive about who wrote which part, right? I, I, you're not, you, you're not going to give us any hints about that tonight. We, we could tell you, but then we'd have to kill you. So, well, we don't want that. It's already been a bad day. That would probably. I was going to say, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, but let me ask you this, um, and maybe we'll ask Lauren since she just popped back in. When your readers oh. guess, are they often right? Often, no. <laughs> in fact. <laughs> Well, interesting. So not just our readers, it's our editors as well. Mm. And that's when we knew we had done something weird and different was with our first book, our editor sent the edits to the wrong authors. I mean, yeah. not of random people, but they sent the wrong section <laughs> edit to the wrong ones of us. And then we switched editors from Karen's longtime editor to Beatrice's and my editor. And she also sent the wrong edits to the wrong authors and now she consistently she'll write us an essay every time she returns <laughs> the edit explaining who she thinks wrote what and why and sometimes she gets it partly right but mostly she gets it wrong and so now we deliberately oh, with oh deliberately we love to mess with our readers. We live for yeah. that. And yeah. Beatrice has a long, a long spiel that she could do if she had time right now explaining <laughs> our thought process in trying to mess with our readers. And the, like it's the princess bride with the poison, you know? Uh, so yeah, we're always trying to out fox everybody. Mm -hmm. And we like usually it. do every once in a while. We have an out outlier who gets yes. it every every time. <laughs> With voice. So if you're really familiar with all three of our voices or even just one of our voices and you're really good with, you know, with voice, uh, you should be able to pick it out. My husband, even though I never tell him which one I'm writing, always immediately can tell which one is my part. So. And just notice. Goodness, right? We deliberately uh, write against type to mess with you. And we know oh, it right. looks oh, really well. So we <laughs> Yes, That's Tyler. so funny that you mentioned the pr Princess Bride. I quoted it today. I said I was <laughs> caught in the swamp of fire with the unusually large creatures. You did. <laughs> you did. The the ever, I know, right? Okay, y'all. Secrets, lies, murders, loves. There is so much good stuff and bad stuff in a good way happening in this book. As PW, for those of you who don't know, Publishers Weekly put it, this Cracker Jack novel offers three mysteries for the price of one. So y'all, a novel of this magnitude is difficult to pull off with one author, much less three. So can you give us a peek behind the curtain? How do you 
approach co-writing a novel like this? Do you have an outline, a brief one? Do you know where you're headed, where you're beginning? Can you tell us a little bit about the actual mechanics? Yes, it's very complicated. We, um, we meet together. So none of us are big outliners, pre-plotters, which is kind of remarkable um, mm -hmm. <laughs> that, we, that we've actually written more than one book. But when we decided to do the first book, we had no idea what we were doing. But of course, when you're writing with three different voices from different parts of the country, you know, Beatrice is in Connecticut, um, Lauren's in Manhattan, and I'm in Atlanta. And, um, you know, so you needed to do something like that. So we basically, we, we meet in some horrible place, like, I don't know, a beach resort or um, someplace with a spa and good food. And um, we basically just, I mean, we work, 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 work. Really, it is a lot of work. We start in the morning, have a lovely breakfast, lots of coffee. And then we work, 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 work till about four or five. And then we break to, for dinner and then we have fun. But it is, we plot the whole book. Then we go off in our little corners of the world. We write round robin. And even when we plot, we do it very, very loosely. So if one of us comes up with, um, oh, this isn't working, I think, I think it would be so much more exciting if we do this. And because, you know, there's always wine involved, you know, the other two are like, yeah, sure, that sounds great. And then we just <laughs> sort of adjust. Um, but that's the joy. And I think that's also why our our voices blend together because mm -hmm. the first person writes their chapter, then they send it to the next person. They read the first chapter, write their chapter, send it to the third person, that third person then reads, you know, so we, you know, we, we can follow on and latch on to things that have been, you know, um, the other authors have written. So it is kind of like writing your own book, but so much more fun um, and only takes a third of the time. So Win -win. Well, I, win. I think one of the key aspects here is that when we sit down and do all this plotting and we have this lovely, you know, three or four days uh, and a, you know, hopefully a great location. Uh, Karen wasn't so excited when we went to the Mount Washington Hotel, no. New Hampshire, uh, to outline. The and she's not uh, too much a fan of the cold weather. <laughs> It was November and Mount Washington does have and they've actually trademarked it. The worst weather in the world. <laughs> Uh, we stayed indoors and we plotted this out and we go through this long process. We do the brainstorming of the characters and the, the general outline. And then we sort of uh, outline each chapter. Uh, and then, and not until the end of that process, do we each claim a character. Uh, so we decide ahead of time. Claim the character once we're done creating that, that mm -hmm. master outline. So it gives us a kind of ownership, common ownership over the whole story. So even though one author brings to life one character, uh, we really kind of all own her, you know, she's, she's ours. And, uh, and, and that kind of gives us this, uh, you know, we are just less territorial that way. We, we are really here to make a great story and to make all these, uh, you know, all these narratives uh, work seamlessly in tandem. What, you know, what happens if the two end. of you want oh. the same character? That never, ever never happened. happened. <laughs> we really oh, have yeah. no conflict with anything. It's sad. Sometimes Beatrice wants quiet and Karen only drinks red and then we have to get her <laughs> Let me do Prosecco. Yeah. So, but yeah. It's a good it's compromise. Just, it's just, I guess, because we all look at it the same way that this is sort of, this is, you know, writing a collaboration with three authors. I mean, it's so something out of all of our wheel boxes. Like, mm -hmm. sure, I'll write this character that I've never written before, whatever, you know, or this time period I've never written. Um, it, it's just a wonderful way to stretch our writing muscles. And I think we all jump to that challenge. We don't want to write the same thing we've always written. That's why we, we're doing this. Yeah. Oh, and then after we're all done, then we meet again at some horrible place. And, um, you know, and, and we finish it all up and then we celebrate, we send it to our editor and then we go and celebrate. Nice. Awesome. Okay. So now take us back a minute. Three authors, three successful writing careers. When was the moment you decided to tackle writing a novel together? And what have you learned along the way? Like, are there any deal breakers in this relationship? 
Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny. We just realized last night that we, we this is our 10th anniversary. I wow. I know. November 2012, I... we were at a writing conference, actually the Romance Writers Association Conference. It was in Anaheim, I uh, California. I don't know if anyone was there, but was uh, there? we wow. were at the bar sort of commiserating about what, a, you know, you know, we'd all finished book tours and uh, with sort of varying degrees of, of enjoyment. And we were talking about how much more fun it is to be sitting at a bar with other authors instead of being there by yourself. So we and thought- other authors that understood sheep puns. I mean, that's yeah. what it's all about, right? Yeah, we kind of flocked uh, together in a- yeah, We did flock together in a woolly, <laughs> really good way. <laughs> Although we know. A few, a few glasses of wine uh, into this conversation, we thought, well, you know, we could go on book together, book tour together if we wrote a book together. Mm -hmm. uh, so let's do that. And it happened. I know it was the summer of 2012 because that was the summer my debut novel came out, which was very much overshadowed by another debut novel that was out that summer, which you may have heard of, uh, Fifty Shades of What? Black, white. <laughs> I think it was gray. gray. Modern gray. Modern gray. Fifty Shades of Way. <laughs> uh, yes. uh, you know, we had this great idea we'll write a book like set in scotland which is very popular and you know dovetails with our whole sheep remember we were drinking it, we, <laughs> we thought okay perfect title 50 shades of plaid right uh in the win. uh and so we stumble out of the bar and who was there my editor, who had until that point had had a lot of respect for me, um, and then we were just like, oh my gosh, we, we want to write this book together and it's going to be called Fifty Shades of Plot. And she basically told us to take an aspirin and sleep it off. And um, But the good, the really great thing is when we went our own separate ways, we didn't, luckily we did put aside the Fifty Shades of Plot thing, but the whole <laughs> idea of doing this thing that we had no idea what it was, write a book together three of us like how how does that happen but i think we are all either naive enough or just like desperate enough <laughs> i don't know we just we really really wanted a publisher to pay for our girls trip and our bar bill and that <laughs> is how we yes. all ended up in new york city plotting the first book and i had a newborn so i really needed that girls trip badly um the funny thing <laughs> When we went to our editors and agents and said, look, we have this great idea. We're going to write a triple timeline book together. And it's not the sheep one. Don't worry. They were horrified. <laughs> and they said, you can't do this. Three authors can't write a book together. That's an anthology. And no yeah. one buys anthologies. And we're like, no, no, no. It's a single book. And they looked at us and said, but there are three of you. And we were like, we know, but it's still a single book. Yeah. And they really only pity bought it because they loved Karen. And they were trying <laughs> to humor her. And we will never forget the surprise in our editor's voice when we sent her the manuscript and she called and she said, this is really good. And, yeah. But really, and when I hit the New York Times, it was that same voice of surprise when she called us like, so <laughs> they got hit the list and we're like, really? And we, yeah. Again, I mean, to be fair, it was so no so. we didn't even have our phones on. We were like out partying because it was like the, you know. But it was fun. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes the best ideas are the ones that you just sort of stumble into, you know? Yeah. I mean, you don't think was. too much about it. You don't yeah. talk, you don't yeah. think enough about it to talk yourself out of it. Yeah. Um, Actually, I, I was honest. Our goals were very modest. It was literally to get our publisher to send us on book tour together and again pay and actually the bar bill thing was was almost an afterthought we was our first event and we had posted this photo on instagram of the three of us with cocktails and it got a lot of likes and our publicist said wow that got a lot of likes could you just keep doing that posting pictures of you drinking together and i'm like okay well, i don't know that sounds to me like a business expense uh so <laughs> Right. Uh, so, you know, mission accomplished. Yeah. So nice. yeah, we, we had these very, you know, modest goals and hopes. Uh, so the whole every time, you know, that the, the books do well and we get great emails from readers and, and all this feedback and, and it's just really icing on the cake. It, it really is. And it, I mean, it's pleasant. I mean, it, I guess, you know, my whole life, I start the, with the bar very low and then, you know, it's not that hard to get over it. So this was, I think that's kind of how we looked at this whole project, like, it'll be fun, you know, whatever. And, awesome. um, and it's, and I think part of your question um, also, uh, Mary Kay, was um, like, how has it changed? I think 
it doesn't get easier. I mean, writing a book is always not easy, but I think what has made it kind of more fun is that our friendship has just grown, you know, tenfold since we started and we've gone through, you know, different life things with each other so that we really know each other really, really well. Um, you know, we know what we're each going through in our own lives. And I think that has just really made our writing more fun, deeper, more, I mean, we've always been committed, but this is something that we really want this to be successful for all of us. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, there's we more about refilling the well. And I think these try books for us, they're our way of refilling the well. Because when we write together, there's just such joy in knowing that your friends have got your back. And then Stevia, when you get stuck and you hear crickets, you can text your friends and be like, so she's not doing what I want her to do in this chapter. What can I do? And suddenly you've got this wonderful support network and the writing is just so much easier. It makes you go back to your own projects rejuvenated. Yeah, Absolutely. That makes sense. That. Yeah. It's our palate cleanser. Um, <laughs> I like that. I have a question, but I'm actually just going to ask a couple of our, we have a million audience questions coming in. So I was just going to like ask you like maybe one or two really quickly. Um, oh, somebody said that they just saw you in Charleston and they loved the book. Oh, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, somebody said to have them tell you the, the sheep story, which you just were psychic and did all <laughs> <laughs> um, where we wear our sheep pins whenever we're on book Oh, tour. I forgot my sheep pin. I should have worn it. Well, not, yeah. none of us are our, our French jeweler Talbot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> they're swinging out on me. Sorry, guys. <laughs> Sorry, um, Marilyn Will Willauer says, "How or who does the revision? So you each do your own section. Is that? Mm -hmm. well, yeah. and we, and we all don't edit each other at all. That's our editor's job." Although we okay. all read the full book, and but when, usually what happens is one of us will ask the others. So I'm having trouble with this revision thing. What do you guys think? How can I fix this? Mm -hmm. Got, it. Mm -hmm. Got it. Okay. And Diane Overton Housel wants to know what was the first book that you wrote together? Yeah. The uh, Forgotten Room. Yeah, New York City. Mm -hmm. in New York City. Yes. In a Gilded Age uh, uh, town, um, mansion, um, um, in what, the Upper East. Side? Upper East. Side. In Manhattan, I don't. In fact, that novel, in that novel, one of the villain in that that book uh, is, in fact, a character who has appeared through all our books. In Cornelia Mary. Styler, we can't kill her. We tried to drown her in Lusitania in the glass ocean, and she wouldn't die. We call her Stella. Against the Google Last book, I read her memoirs in. Uh, uh, all the ways we said goodbye in the bar at the Paris Ritz. Uh, mm -hmm. And and then we find, of course, those memoirs in the library of the uh, the Sprague Mansion in mm -hmm. uh, in Newport. So mm -hmm. yeah, everything all ties together. Mm -hmm. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. I love those little Easter eggs. It's so fun uh -huh. as a reader to get to see the ties together. Um, well, ladies, before we say goodbye, we selfishly really love having a writing tip from our guests. So do you each have a quick writing tip that you could give to us tonight and to, and to everybody else watching too, not just. <laughs> uh, you know, for me, I just finished a book yesterday. So congratulations. congratulations. That's awesome. Oh my gosh. Yeah. So that's why I'm a little discombobulated. You know, for me, I've, since the very beginning, something that I've adhered to, you know, the old Nike thing, just do it sit your butt in the chair and do it. Don't think of all the yep. millions of reasons why you have no idea what you're doing because after it's actually, I've written like 33 novels. I still believe I have no idea what I'm doing when I start a book yeah. and, um, and I just do it anyway. Um, so yeah, just do it. Sit down and write, close off those voices in your head. Don't think of anybody reading over your shoulder and just write for you. I love that. I love it. Good one. That was kind of mine. So I'm madly trying to think <laughs> of one. And I, you know, I, I mean, I think the main thing is, uh, you know, you have to uh, be able, and I think we as women have a really hard time doing this, uh, giving yourself permission to sit down and have that time to yourself and, 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 and not allow the distractions to uh, overwhelm what it is you're trying to do. I think the- AKA laundry. Yeah. Get, I know. <laughs> 
you know, but I would also say the best thing that I do when I'm really stuck is just to get up and walk around or do a chore. And that line of dialogue that is just not coming, it's, you know, this, as soon as you get up and you go water the plants or mm -hmm. fold the laundry, suddenly it'll just pop into your head. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. kind of my, my, favorite tip for when I'm stuck. Uh, okay. It usually works. <laughs> it's it's so that. true. My husband actually bought me these special shower notes that you can write on in the shower. So I would stop. <laughs> Are you kidding me? That's awesome. That's awesome. I'll send you some, Karen. They're great. And it's really, it stopped me leaving trails through the apartment every time. I'm like, oh my God, there's an idea. Forget the conditioner. I have to write this down. Um, <laughs> my tip, aside from shower notes, get them, is um, close related to these other two it's give yourself license to play there's no right or wrong just sit down and write something that amuses you and entertains you because sometimes the book you're meant to write might not be the book you think you're supposed to write but just write whatever comes out because you can fix a bad page but not a blank one absolutely yeah. amen it. Love that. Great tips. Well, yeah. ladies, we have so enjoyed having you here. And we know Thank that um, our viewers are so thrilled because they love you so much. And your books are talked about so often on our page. So thank you for sharing your night with us. Thank you for having us. Thank you very much. Yes, you guys are amazing. And it's very inspirational to us to see, you know, what you guys are doing celebrating authors and books. So thank oh, you for all yes. of that and all you do. And independent booksellers, too, because yeah, they are really the lifeblood of what we do. So, yay. Well, we love our teams, you know, our two, our teams. We make it, we make it work, right? Um, but everybody out there, um, don't forget to grab your copy of The Lost Summers of Newport from your favorite book retailer or our bookshop.org store. Thanks, guys. Thanks, ladies. Thanks, ladies. Bye, ladies. Bye, ladies. Bye, ladies. Bye. All right, that was so fun. Oh my gosh, we just need a long show. So many questions about the process. I, and I know. I know. Um, I have to ask. We're getting ready to bring Miriam on, but um, really quickly, Mary Jo Spring said, "I would like to see the Fab Four write a book together." Thoughts, Kathy? Let me guess. No. <laughs> <laughs> She's great. I think what we could do is like. The three of us write it and just say one of them is Kathy's. Yeah. But, but yeah. Ka Kathy, didn't you hear? They'll pay for your drinking bill. <laughs> They'll pay for our Ooh. wine. Or, you know. Here's, here's, here is my, here's my newsflash for you all. I could buy my own wine. Yeah. <laughs> and, and right now I'm not drinking. So I'm not drinking <sighs> wine anyway. So who cares? Oh my God. <laughs> Well, that was so fun. And we have another amazing segment coming up with um, another fabulous author. Please welcome to the Friends in Fiction stage, Miriam Parker. So Miriam, who I have known since I sold my very first book all the way back in 2004, is the author of The Shortest Way Home and Room and Board. She also works as the associate publisher of Echo. She earned a BA in English from Columbia and an MFA in creative writing from UNC Wilmington. Near she me. lives in Brooklyn. I know, right near Christy. So she lives in Brooklyn with her spaniel, Leopold Bloom. Uh -huh. Sean, let's bring Miriam on. Hi. Bonus points Hi. if someone can say where Leopold Bloom is from. Ooh. Oh. But I'm going to go with your... Oxford. I don't know. That's what I was just sitting here thinking. It's like, I know I know Leopold Bloom, but I can't think of what it's from. Um, he's It's from Ulysses. I was going to say, isn't oh. that James Joyce? It's yeah. James yeah. Joyce, yeah. So when I got um, when I got a dog, I was like, I, I think I have to give it a literary name. Love it. <laughs> Leopold Bloom is a dang good one, Miriam. Yeah. But we okay. mostly call him Leo. And I recently told a friend of mine who I've known for many years that his real name is Leopold Bloom. And he was like, oh, I respect you more now. <laughs> Fair. Oh, so cute. I love that. Um, I, I, I knew this and I didn't talk to you about it backstage, but um, I live just a couple hours from UNC Wilmington. So oh, that's so fun. I'm so jealous. It's like the years that I spent in Wilmington were the best. And I didn't, I almost didn't realize how good I had it when I was living there until I came back to New York and I was like, wait, I lived near the beach for three years and I did not properly take oh. advantage of that. <laughs> it's a great place to live. It really is. Well, um, we are so excited to have you tonight and I'm so excited to talk about your wonderful, fabulous, unputdownable new book, Room and Board. So can you tell us what Room and Board is about? And then can you tell us what it's really about? 
Um, <laughs> well, um, so the book is about um, Jillian Brody, who is a New York City celebrity publicist whose life kind of explodes um, through a sort of back alley Me Too scandal. And she quits her life and she um, this opportunity pops up for her to go back to her high school alum, alma mater, which is a boarding school and is in um California. Um, there aren't that many boarding schools in California, but so I decided to make one up. Um, <laughs> and while she's there, she sort of becomes the like, she becomes the dorm mom to a bunch of kind of recalcitrant teenagers and also reconnects with um, her high school love. And so it's kind of a book about, you know, figuring out who you really want to be, um, going back to where you came from and seeing, you know, like, are you really that person that you thought you were when you were young? So, I mean, my books are all actually about this sort of path not taken. Like I have, I've always basically lived in New York. I've worked in book publishing. I did go to grad school, but I even worked in book, book publishing then. Um, and I always have kind of wondered like, what would it be like to like quit your life and move to California and work in a winery or like work in a school? And so my books basically are like secret dream fulfillments for me of things that I never actually did. <laughs> I think we all do that. Yeah. But, right. We're like writing our other lives. Yeah. <laughs> it's so true. It's yeah, and it's funny. I, I feel like the older you get, like the older we get, the more, the more that path not taken idea really starts to sink in. Right. Yeah. And it's so interesting when you do interviews for fiction, like so many people are trying to figure out what's true about your book. And actually like what's true about my book are like little tiny details, like, like little things I throw in for my friends and stuff like that. But like most of it really is like, exactly not true it's like what didn't happen you know? ah, I love that oh, I love that what a fun thing to explore in fiction so Miriam you told Writer's Digest in an interview I always want to write the book that I most want to read which I love why was this the book you wanted to read and what was the first spark that made you know that this was the next project you just had to take on well, it's it's actually the boarding school element of it, which is funny because I didn't go to boarding school. Again, like not true. Um, not yeah. But I, The Secret History is just one of my most favorite books, like just one of those books that oh I've like gosh. torn through a bunch of times. And I recently, you know, I, I just I just love the idea of boarding school, like being just young enough that you don't really know yourself and being taken out of your, you know, and like thrown into this world that you don't quite understand. And so, um, the, so the beginning of it was really boarding school. Um, and I was like, but I knew I wanted to set it in California. And so I was like, well, what would a California boarding school be like? Like, it would be different, I think, than an East Coast boarding school. So everyone is like sort of like celebrity adjacent and like a little bit, you know, like their lives are a little bit different than like sort of stuffy East Coast people. No offense <laughs> to the stuffy East Coast people. As <laughs> well. I find myself, Miriam, I find myself amazed that not only were you writing this book, during a pandemic, which we all did too. Mm -hmm. But in the middle of all that, you you kind of topped, you, you, you just topped us all by having a baby. <laughs> yeah. You win. Yeah. My yeah, daughter was two. Yeah, she was born in March, 2020. So oh. that was crazy timing. <laughs> um, uh -huh. So most of the book was actually written before she was born. Let's just be honest about that. Um, so I had written about 45,000 words of the book, and I think it's 80,000. So half, more than half of the book is written. And um, it actually was kind of a huge benefit for me because I, you know, I have a full-time job that's actually pretty demanding in terms of not only like the nine to five, but reading at night and on the weekends. And so being on maternity leave actually really helped me finish wow. drafting the novel. So I gave myself, I knew that when people had told me that when your baby is born, like your brain just like turns to mush and that did absolutely happen yeah. to me. So I was like, I'm not even going to try to work on it until she's two months old. And so basically I took the last, I, I took four months maternity leave. So the last two months of my maternity leave, while uh, while she napped, I finished drafting the book. So, and she was a very good napper. She is no longer a good sleeper, but she was when she was a baby. So, <laughs> okay. So now, walk us through a day in the life of Miriam Parker, like juggling nine to five and writing and baby and. Um... Yeah, it's wild. I also have a very nice husband who. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> you know, when I was like finishing the book would like take her out for long walks and things like that. And like, just took her out for some chocolate ice cream, things like that. So, um, but yeah, I mean, you know, my main writing is really a side line for me. And I kind of wonder what it would be like to be a full-time writer, but I, you know, I write when I'm drafting, I write only about 500 words a day. That's about as much as my brain can really do. And I, but if you do 500 words a day, every day for, you know, a year, right. you, you have a book. Have a book. So, yeah. So that's kind of always been my approach. Before I had a child, I used to write early in the morning. Now I kind of write like in little snippets of time that I can catch, you know, when she's sleeping or busy. Um, but like my, you know, the thing that pays the bills is not my writing, it's my day job. So that's what I do most of the time. <laughs> now, did your, did becoming a mom change your perspective on your story? You know, I kind of, you know, I really love writing about intergenerational friendships. Um, and I love, and I'm, I've become kind of obsessed with mentorship. And this book is actually a little bit about, you know, mentorship. And my last book was about sort of a young woman being, becoming friends with an older couple. And this book is about kind of a middle-aged woman becoming friends with, you know, some people that are younger than her. And I do actually think that, you know, there is a maternal, I had, I had a maternal instinct before, I started before I had a child that like was very like focused into my job and like taking care of the young people, you know, that I work with. And so I think that was sort of what inspired the book. So in some ways that, you know, a lot of times I feel like you're writing a books that are about like thing, you know, or like that are inspired by things that happened long ago. But in some ways this like kind of like looked forward as opposed to looking back, mm -hmm. if that makes any sense. Yeah, definitely. That's and it's right. funny because when I start writing, I, I don't allow myself to stop until I've gotten 500 words down. 500 words is the minimum. And, yeah. and then I, then I name my, my file, <laughs> but that's one of the tricks I use too. Yeah. Oh, Patty, you're muted. Patty, you're muted. You're muted, Patty. <laughs> I was practicing my sign language. Yeah. <laughs> I think I think 500 words, it, it, it's a good um, like when there's a day, even for us, what we right. check in each other with each yeah. other. Did you do your words? And 500 counts in a big yep. way, Miriam. Yep. So don't discount that like it's nothing because those add up. And the next thing you know, you have 80,000 of those 500 yeah. words that yeah. add up together. So you wrote the most charming essay for Lit Hub recently titled Dear Sally Albright, 40 is only the beginning, which is so relatable, although that was 18 years ago for me. But you talk a lot about your path and how it looked different than you had perhaps imagined, but ended up being perfect for you, Marion Parker. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got to where you are now, a little bit about your path and how that journey may or may not be reflected in the protagonist of Room and Board? Well, you know, I definitely like, you know, I was one of those people who was like, you know, I say in the essay, I was a late bloomer, but actually I kind of wasn't, you know, I was like on, I was doing everything right. You know, I got A's, I went to an Ivy League college. I, you know, I got a good job right out of college. I worked in book publishing. Like I, you know, I kind of was like, oh, I've got it all figured out. And then it was like, oh, but then the next thing you're supposed to do is like meet a guy and get married and have a baby. And like, that just was not what was happening to me. I was like running around New York, like having a good time, um, you know, like, just messing around and I had a, I was having fun, but I wasn't, um, I wasn't doing any of the things that it sort of seemed like I should be doing. Like, if, you know, you followed a traditional path. Um, and then I was like, I'm going to go to grad school. And, you know, so I did all these things that seemed a, a little bit like what, um, what the, the, the W women were saying before that, like the best ideas are the ones you don't think about too much. Like that's kind of like the way I led my life <laughs> uh, for a long time. And I think that, you know, which, and it, but at some point you're like, oh, am I doing, am I making a mistake? Or like, did I like waste all those years? And like, in retrospect, I completely didn't, you know? Um, and I needed all that time to like figure out who I really was, who I really wanted to be. You know, it took, it also did take me a long time to write my first novel. I mean, my first novel wasn't published until I was 38. Um, and, and I think that like, you know, it, again, like I went to grad school when I was in my 20s and I was like, oh, you know, I'm going to get out of grad school. I'm going to get an agent. And like, it just didn't go that way, you know. And in, some, in, in retrospect, I'm glad that the first novel that I wrote didn't get published, you know. Um, so I think a lot of things that and the, my books, 
they often talk about like fate and you know what's meant to be versus like what everyone is sort of trying to shoehorn into happening yeah. and i really do believe in fate i believe that like the thing that is supposed to happen will eventually happen it might not happen in the timeline that you want it yeah. to but i think that it will eventually and so that is kind of a, a theme that i'm exploring in, in all of my books just because it's like something that i feels true to me i love that and i think um i I think that um, people often ask if I regret, because I was a nurse first, that I didn't take writing classes. And I always say that there's all these stepping stones to where we are today. And Miriam, they work out. Yeah, they yeah. work out. And I'm sure like all the things you learned as a nurse are so important to your writing. Like all right. the like human emotions that you experienced and the people that you Family, talked to. Family, drama, oh, all of you it. Saw it yeah. all. And so like so many, I feel like, writers like that if you come out of college and you just write a novel like you haven't experienced anything yet you know yeah. like having a few life experiences like can't hurt you, you know? <laughs> and so I also true. think that once you become a writer you kind of end up like inside a lot and not as like engaged you know with different people's lives and things like that and that's what books are really about and so I think yeah. that having those like experiences banked when you're young can only help you later <laughs> <laughs> when you're trying to write That's about that. Good too. point. Yeah. I can remember when I was a newspaper reporter thinking that I was a failure because I didn't win the Pulitzer Prize that I thought I would win when I was 20. Um, <laughs> and then. Or 21. <laughs> or 20. Uh, so I don't know. I, uh, so I worked in newspapers for 14 years and then I got my first book published. And it wasn't until the first book came out that I realized it wasn't that I'd failed at journalism. I had just had a really long extended apprenticeship to be a novelist. Yes. I love that. That's great. Yeah. I love well, that. Well, Miriam, you have a pretty extraordinary career and that you're in the position to see all sides of publishing as both author and associate publisher at Echo. So going into writing a novel, do you think there are things that you learned in your publishing career that helped you when you were beginning your writing career? And more important... Do you ever feel like you know too much? Yeah, I, <laughs> I actually, um, I don't recommend that people in publishing write novels. It's not a good idea. <laughs> what? Um, I know way too much. And actually I need to turn off the publisher part of my brain when I like work with my my team. Like I, I really have to like not associate publisher them. And I, I think I'm good at it. I, I don't know if any of them are here, but like I, I hope that I am. What I do is I try to just I trust them. I know that they are working hard, even if they are not emailing me every minute and that yeah. so much goes on behind the scenes at a publishing company. And a lot of it is just like little nudges of people, you know, and like yeah. those little nudges of are really important. And um, even if they only take five minutes, you know, out of it, out of a week, like that's the most important thing that that person did in that day for me, you know? So, um, so I wish, I will say, I wish I had learned more. Like I, I think, you know, but so I just, all I've learned is that I need to write the book that I want to write and that I want to read because you have to read it so many times, which is one thing I've learned from being a writer. And I've definitely learned to respect, I think, even more than I did before the editors that I work with, because I'm not one thing I'm not as an editor and like just seeing how involved they were, you know, my editor is in my books and like the care that she takes with me. Um, I really appreciate it. And it just makes me realize just what my colleagues do even on an even deeper level. So in some ways I think it makes me, a, I don't know, I think it makes me a better writer, but I do think it makes me a better publisher because I think mm. I understand a lot more like what the authors and the editors are going through before it gets to the part where I really get involved, which is like in the sales and marketing and kind of the end, the end of the process. Oh. So it actually seems like publishing people should get involved in writing novels because then they might have a bit more empathy yeah. for us. Like, you know. <laughs> Right. That's amazing. So mm -hmm. since you're on the inside and you're always seeing the other books coming out and you're at Echo and I know you're a big reader, I want you to tell us what you have read and loved lately. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> well, I actually, the thing that I love the most that I cannot stop talking about, and actually I'm becoming annoying, um, is Tomorrow and Tomorrow and Tomorrow by Gabrielle Zeman. I'm reading it, right? I'm listening oh. to it right now. Oh my God. Yeah. I love it. I, I loved reading it more than that experience of reading that book, like made me remember why books are good, you know? Oh. So, and I mean, I remember it every day. I mean, and certainly we publish amazing authors at Echo that like, that do remind you like, I love books, you know? But um, that one reminded me this summer, like oh, books are, can do things that are cool. Oh, that's <laughs> awesome. 
I love that. That's awesome. What a great recommendation. Well, yeah. well, Miriam, if you wouldn't mind sticking around for just a couple more minutes, we have more to talk about, but first, just a few reminders from us. So I'm here again because you know how much I love our writer's block podcasts. So every Friday, we have a new episode that drops, and we always put an announcement on the Facebook page to tell you who we talked to this week. And on the most recent episode, Ron and Meg, who has been joining us on our podcast, which has been so great because she's so good at it. And they talked to Christine Pride and Joe Piazza about their very talked about, much touted novel, We Are Not Like Them, which was a Good Morning America pick just released now in paperback. And this week, this coming Friday in a couple days, Ron and I will talk to Carrie Morey, who is a cookbook author, a TV personality, and the founder of Callie's Hot Little Biscuits. Her book is called Hot, her cookbook is called Hot Little Summers. And she has a new, she has a second season of her PBS show coming up. And it was a really interesting conversation. So y'all need to tune in for that. So is it Hot Little Summers or Hot Little Suppers? Did I say Summers? <laughs> That's the kind of day it's been. So, <laughs> I know. Yeah, I'm so it's Hot Little, little Suppers. <laughs> and actually, I um, pulled it out. I'm going to make two of the recipes. My husband's Ooh. birthday is this weekend. And I'm going to make two of the recipes because they look really, really Ooh, good. Awesome. awesome. You have to share them on the Instas. I will. Oh, that's a good idea. That's a good yeah. idea. Yeah. Okay. So also, I want to talk to you all about the Friends in Fiction official book club which is different from the Fable Book Club. We're having a blast. And if you're not there, you're missing out. So the group, which is a separate Facebook page and is run by our friends, Lisa Harrison and Brenda Gardner, is now 14,000 strong. Brenda and Lisa, otherwise known as PB&J, choose the books and host the authors for monthly chats. They have happy hours with our Writer's Block podcast host, Ron Block, and they keep everybody in the loop about suggested reads in upcoming releases. And we hope you'll join them September 19th when they'll be discussing The Lost Book of Eleanor Dare by our good friend, Kimberly Brock. And have you heard? Our new Friends in Fiction first edition box is available from Booktown in Manasquan, New Jersey. And it features signed hardback first editions from all four of us in 2023 and just this darling little Friends in Fiction kitchen towel that says, dinner can wait. It's time for Friends in Fiction. So if you're <laughs> thinking about picking up our 2023 books, we hope you are. That is a great place to get them all together and know that they're going to arrive to you signed with that extra little gift. Yep. Speaking of 2023, next year, we will be doing at least four Friends in Fiction live events, one during each of our book tours. So stay tuned for news about those four events so you can mark your calendars and make your travel plans to join us as we take our show on the road in April, May, June, and again in the fall. Um, okay, Miriam, one last question for you. Thank you for your patience. Um, what were the values around reading and writing when you were growing up? Oh, that's a good question. I mean, my dad is a teacher um, and our house was full of books and we went to the library all the time. And actually we really were more library people than we were like book buying people, um, which is why I always love it when I see someone that's taken my book out of the library. Mm -hmm. um, so it was really, it was, I mean, probably it was like the number one thing that I was encouraged to do was to read and to write when I was little. I had a, um, I'll never, I had an Apple IIe that I used to write stories on. And I had, I don't, I don't know if you guys remember those floppy, floppy disks. And I remember oh, yeah. I, my stories were so long that they would fill up the floppy disks. And like, <laughs> I don't know what really what they were about, but um, I was very busy writing them. And I, that was a really important part of my childhood. <laughs> Did you know how to type? Well, you, you know, kind of like this. Yeah. Hunt and peck. Yeah. I learned how to type in high school, but I had been using a computer since, you know, since I was little. That's, That's awesome. awesome. Well, Miriam, thank you so much for spending time with us tonight. We had um, such a good time with you. And we just want to remind everybody out there to pick up your fabulous new book, Room and Board, from um, your bookseller of choice or our bookshop.org shop. So thank you. Thank you Thanks, so much. Miriam. It was, it was such a highlight for me. So thank you. I really appreciate you. Oh, you were so fun. So fun. So good to see you, Miriam. Like Love your energy. Oh. So great. Yeah. Same. This is great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Miriam.
Well, everybody, um, it's been another great night on Friends of Fiction, and we just want to remind you that you can find all of our back episodes on YouTube. We're live there every week, just like we are on Facebook, and if you subscribe, you won't miss a thing. Be sure to come back right here next week, uh, same time, same place. We welcome Christina McMorris, who I talked on the phone to for two hours today, so if my book is late, we know why. <laughs> oh my gosh, that's awesome. She's oh, so she's great. she's the best. Yeah, I can't I wait. Know, we had so much fun catching up. I think we thought it was going to be like a 10-minute conversation, and then like, and two hours. hours. Yeah. It's <laughs> awesome. Good night, everybody. Good night, Good night everybody. Good night. Night. See you next week. Thank you for tuning in. You can join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. Also, subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here.